Okay. So for blunt abdominal trauma, we're going to start in the right upper quadrant. Indicator is going to be towards the patient's head, uh, mid axillary line. We're going to find our hepatorenal interface. We're going to look where we want to. We're going to require, and then we're going to fan down to the bed, up to the abdomen, back and forth. Here our click. Next clip that we're going to get is going to be up into the chest. So we're going to angle just a little bit up towards the patient's head. You can see that move is just a little bit of a tilt uh, up to the patient's head. We're going to see um, a bright white line on the left side of our screen. That's going to be our diaphragm. We're going to look for fluid behind that. We're going to acquire that clip as well. We can do a little bit of fanning there just to make sure there's nothing black back there. Uh, and that's going to be what we're going to want to see for our right upper quadrant. Moving over to our left upper quadrant, make sure that we're labeling. Uh, we're going to keep the indicator towards the patient's head. Once again, we're going to find our splenorenal space over here. Sometimes it's spleens, it's a little bit more posterior, so kind of coming back to the posterior axillary line. Indicator towards the head again. We're going to see the kidney and splenorenal interface. We're going to hit acquire. We're going to fan down to the bed, up to the patient's abdomen. Here the click. That's our three second loop. Now we're going to tilt up towards the patient's head. Once again, just kind of angling up that way so that we can see up through the spleen into the diaphragm using our spleen as our acoustic window. Seeing that bright white line and looking for black behind it, we're going to acquire that clip as well. Fan just a little bit if you want to, making sure there's no black behind that. Third space we're going to go is down into the pelvis. So we've already done right upper quadrant, right chest. We've done left upper quadrant, left chest. And now we're going to look into the, belt, and then the pelvis doing a bladder transverse and long indicator towards the patient's right. We're going to look there. We're going to go acquire, fan all the way down into the pelvis, all the way back up. Here are the click. Indicator going to rotate 90 degrees counterclock, excuse me, we're going to rotate transducer 90 degrees clockwise up towards the patient's head, looking down into the pelvis until we see bladder. We're also going to see pubic symphysis with shadowing behind it. That's where we know we're at the right time. Hit acquire, we're going to fan to the right, fan to the left, making sure that we see everything. Now we've got a good uh, bladder and pelvis views looking for free fluid. So we've done right upper quadrant, right chest, left upper quadrant, left chest, bladder, transverse, and long. And now we're going to go up to subxiphoid. We're going to come just below the subxiphoid process. Indicator stays pointed towards the patient's right. Coming down just a couple centimeters onto the patient. Usually have to increase our depth just a little bit. Seeing that posterior pericardial line angling up there. Using our liver as our acoustic window. We're going to acquire a clip there. Noting that our grip has changed from an... Uh, a pencil grip to an overhand grip, really just pressing the, the transducer flat against the patient's abdomen, not applying any pressure into the xiphoid process at all. This should not be painful for the patient. Hey, what's up? Oh. All right, from there, uh, we're gonna bring the transducer up in a cross section, bring our depth up a little bit so we can see uh, aorta and IVC here. Um, indicator stays important towards the patient's right, acquiring a clip of that. Rotating the transducer 90 degrees clockwise up towards the patient's head, finding where the IVC enters the right atrium, acquiring that picture. Good. Then we're going to go from abdominal and cardiac up into the patient's chest. I like to switch transducers, particularly for skinnier patients. Uh, using a high frequency transducer so gives us better. So uh -huh. now you're not doing speed. Uh -huh. So I made you do, redo the abdomen super fast. You know? Okay, just because you wanted the pictures. I don't know. What do you want me to do now? Just do do chest and IJs like you normally. Okay, so go a little bit slower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like okay. You're really teaching somebody. Okay. Because I wanted to speed around the abdominal. Cool. So like the way you do better than I don't know about that, but all right. So for lung imaging, when you're doing assessment of pneumothorax, rem remembering that we already did our hemothorax assessment, fluid goes posteriorly uh, into the de dependent regions. We looked on our right and left upper quadrant. Now we want to look anteriorly on the patient's chest because air rises when the patient is supine. So we're going to start on the right side. Uh, always want to kind of work systematically. Start on your right upper quadrant through abdominal. Going to go for the right upper right chest when you do this. So making sure that we're labeling right lung to start. Uh, classically, we want to go with the most um, anterior portion of the patient's chest. We're going to count about second, third intercostal space, midclavicular line, kind of the classic place where they used to do needle decompressions. So there we're going to be able to see, um, we're going to come across a rib, making sure that we see the pleural line, which is a bright white line that is just under our rib there. Finding that, we're going to acquire that, 
three second clip, making sure that the patient breathes during that time. So that means if the patient's intubated, they need to be bagged or waiting for a, a breath to trigger on the vent. Once again, you need to see the rib. So your transducer cannot be horizontal in between rib spaces. You need to be vertical across our intercostal space, usually about second or third intercostal space, midclavicular line. Go from right lung, make sure you erase it, go over to the left side. So anytime that you're not sure if you see lung sliding, you wanna go ahead and compare that uh, to the other side. That's usually the best way to tell. Sometimes it is difficult to tell between patients who are COPDers or they're really, really deep. If that's the case, um, make sure you're comparing the opposite side. Labeling left lung, wire, making sure we see our rib. You can also use M mode imaging, which we'll do on this side making sure that when you click M mode, you set your cursor up where you find a nice bright white piece of pleura there. Clicking M mode again, waiting for it on the other side. You can see that the pleural line moves, that the image is very pixelated. to find the bright white pleural line. Everything underneath that should be nice and pixelated if there's lung sliding. We're gonna compare that to the other side if we need to. Freeze and acquire to save your M mode image. What else do you want me to do, Sarah? IJ. You want me to go ahead and do the IJs? All right, when we switch over to IJs, we're gonna keep our linear high frequency transducer. We're gonna, um, we're gonna keep our linear high frequency transducer, but we wanna change our presets because uh, we're looking for some different stuff um, for that, making sure we're clearing our previous uh, presets. Once again, we wanna start on the right side. We're gonna start in cross section, so our indicators can be pointed towards the patient's right, about the level of the cricoid. Keeping in mind that we do need to hold C-spine if the patient you do need to hold C-spine if the patient's in a collar. Uh, just take the anterior piece of the collar off. Here, level of the cricoid, just floating, uh, resting your hand on the patient's clavicle, uh, giving yourself a nice bit of gel there as to not compress the IJ, because we're really looking about collapse and compression, uh, or collapsibility of the IJ when we're looking at fluid responsiveness. So find your image there, we're gonna acquire. It gives us a few seconds of imaging. From there, we do want to get longitudinal imaging, which is a little bit more difficult, but we're going to rotate our transducer towards the patient's head, so 90 degrees in the clockwise direction. Here, we should be able to see what we're looking for. Once again, resting your hand on the patient, indicator towards the patient's head, and acquiring that image there. When you move over to your left side, just make sure you're labeling appropriately, clearing off the right-sided indicators. Give yourself a little bit more gel, once again, because you need to float your transducer not to compress the IJ. So, it's got gel over your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, resting your hand on the patient here, level of the cricoid. Um, So when you switch over from your right to your left, make sure you clear off the labeling on your spark. Go ahead and give yourself some new gel. Make sure that you're floating your transducer nicely. You're gonna rest, it, rest yourself on the patient's hand, level of the cricoid. We wanna make sure that we're not applying pressure to collapse the IJ, because that's what we're looking for as our marker of volume responsiveness. Acquire our image and cross section here. Go ahead and take, keep your hand there, rotate that transducer. 90 degrees clockwise towards the patient's head. Find your IJ there, go ahead and acquire that image again. Now we've got imaging of the right IJ and left IJ in both cross section and longitudinal. We're looking for collapse. I think we're good. That's enough today. Do you want me to see some pictures of the program? Yeah, I'm sure we can gather now.